So we are given a differential equation, dB dt, that represents the rate at which um, a baby bird is gaining weight. Right? Um, it's proportional to the difference between its adult weight and its current weight, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, B of t is the weight of the bird in grams at any time t days after it was first weighed. And we know that when it was first weighed at t equals zero, it weighed 20 grams. So first thing we are asked to do is figure out if this bird is gaining weight faster when it weighs 40 grams or faster when it weighs 70 grams. So at which of those times or which of those weights is it gaining weight more quickly? Well, dB dt is the rate at which it gains the weight, the rate at which its change of weight is changing. So all we have to do is plug in um, 40 and 70 into dB dt. So for part A, we'll find dB dt at the bird's weight is 40, and we'll find dB dt when the bird's weight is 70. So when the bird's weight is 40, that ought to be 60 over 5, 100 minus 40 over 5, that ought to be 12. And when the bird's weight was, Dylan was 70, I think it was asking about, is that right? That ought to be 6. And so clearly, at a weight of 40, it's gaining weight more rapidly when it weighs 40 grams. Easy enough on that one? So you didn't have to like do what we did in the past where we found the derivative of that or anything like that? No, nope. we found like a slope and a point. Okay. No, nope, this is already the rate at which it gains weight. Okay. And so, I mean, you know, dB dt is already the rate. B is the weight. So dB dt is the rate at which it's changing. Just plug in the values you're given into your equation. <clears throat> All right. Um, good or no? What was the and point breakdown on that? Um, so one point if you tried to use dB dt, and another point for the correct answer with a reason. And your reasoning is, you know, 12 is greater than 6, that's an acceptable enough reason. Okay. All right. Part B says find the second derivative, okay? And then use the second derivative to explain why this graph cannot resemble, or why, why the actual graph of B cannot be this graph. So first thing we did was we found the second derivative. So the derivative of one fifth of 100 minus B. So the one fifth is just a constant. So we'll keep that out front. And then the derivative of 100 minus b is negative b times dB dt, because you're taking the derivative of b with respect to t. So this then, uh, not sorry, not negative b, just negative one, negative one times dB dt. Um, and then dB dt. is one fifth of 100 minus b. And we end up with the second derivative is negative 1 25th of 100 minus b. And that part of it was one point. So getting the correct second derivative. And then the reason why that graph, well, why can't that graph um, why can't our graph resemble B? Well, we're looking at a maximum weight of 100 grams here on our graph. 
what can you tell me about the second derivative if b is always less than 100? It's always negative. It's always negative, exactly. Second derivative always negative means always concave down, but that graph is not. So that's why it couldn't be that. Right? That graph is sometimes concave up. So that doesn't make any sense. And that's your second point is saying graph's supposed to be concave down, but it's not. So some sort of explanation there. Good or not? All right, part C says you use separation of variables to actually find an equation for B, which is you know our particular solution with the initial condition that B of zero is 20. So just like we've done with all of these ones, we need to separate the variables. So we started with dB dt equals one fifth of 100 minus B. We'll bring the 100 minus B to the other side. And then get one fifth of dt over here. Uh, separating the variables properly, that's one point. And then you got one point for the correct antiderivatives. So this side, you do the u substitution. u is 100 minus b. du is negative 1 dB. So you got to put a negative inside, a negative outside. And you get negative natural log absolute value of 100 minus b. And this side, you get 1 fifth t plus your constant. So one point for the correct integrals, one point for having a constant in integration. And then plugging in the appropriate values to find your uh, to find your constant gives you the fourth point. And we can also at this point, if we want to, we don't have to at this point, but if we want to, we can eliminate our um, absolute value because we're always talking about this weight is going to top out at 100. Um, but we can leave it there for now. It's always going to be a positive value. Um, we started off with 20, right? And t was zero. So our constant is negative ln 80. So that's our fourth point right there is using your initial condition to solve. And now we've got negative natural log of absolute value 100 minus b equals 1 fifth t minus ln 80. We're going to divide by that negative 1 to give us ln 100 minus b equals ln 80 minus 1 fifth t. Then we'll exponentiate both sides. That gives us our absolute value of 100 minus b equals e to the ln 80 is 80. So then it's 80 e to the negative 1 fifth t. And then we'll clear off the absolute values. And like we said, we know that this is always going to be a um, positive number up here. So we can just keep the positive version of it. But we could also, if we wanted to, we can test our initial condition and just say, right, if we plug in 20, right, um, we need to have a zero over here, right? And so e to the zero is 1, 80 equals 100 minus 20. 100 minus 20 is not negative 80, so we got to use the positive value. Um, and then we can add the b and subtract the other, so we end up with b equals 100 minus 80 e to the negative. One fifth T. And that was the fifth point. Any questions on that? 
Can you go back to part B and explain why it's always concave down? Um, our second derivative is always negative. Right, negative 1 25th of 100 minus B. And based on this graph, B is always less than 100. So yeah. B is always less than 100. Negative 1 25th times a positive is always a negative number, which tells us the second derivative is always negative. Second derivative is negative. It tells you your function is concave down. But clearly in this graph, the function is not always concave down. And so therefore, this graph cannot represent B. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. Any other questions there? That first one, the baby bird. All right, let's do the trash problem. So we got a landfill, it's got a bunch of solid waste. Um, in fact, it has 1,400 tons of solid waste at the beginning of 2010. That sounds like an initial condition to me. Um, we've got an increasing function W that tells us how much waste is actually in the landfill. Um, and they've estimated that dw dt um, is the differential equation that satisfies w for the next 20 years. So um, first off, we want to use the line tangent to the graph of w at t equals 0 to approximate how much waste will be in the landfill at the end of the first three months, and they're nice enough here to tell you that's t equals one fourth, in case you didn't read well enough to see that t is measured in years from the start of 2010. So um, we need to write an equation for the line tangent to w at t equals zero, which means we've got to use the point that T equals zero, W equals 1400. And we need to plug that in to our differential equation. So we're gonna put in, um, uh, what did I just say? 1400 in four, our W. So we've got 125th. Fourteen hundred minus what was this? Three hundred, right? Yeah. To find out our slope, and fourteen hundred minus three hundred is eleven hundred, and eleven hundred over twenty-five should go in what? Um, forty-four times. So our slope is forty-four. So our tangent lines equation should be y equals 44t plus our y-intercept there, 1400 y equals mx plus b. And then we're approximating this, or approximating the amount by using 1 fourth. So 44 times 1 fourth plus 1400 gives us 11 more. So 1411 tons after three months. And two points for that. One was for finding the correct slope, and one was for getting the correct answer. Any questions there on part A? Nope. All right. Part B. Asks us to find the second derivative. You probably note that that's a pretty common thing. So part B, finding the second derivative. The 125th that was out in the front is still going to stay. 
This time it's just W minus 300. So the derivative of that is dW dt. So that gives us 1 25th of 1 25th of W minus 300 or 1 625th of W minus 300 is our second derivative. Um, we know that our amount of waste is always increasing and it started at 1400. So W is always greater than or equal to 1400. So W greater than or equal to 1400 tells us that our second derivative is always greater than zero, which tells us that W is always concave. Up, since we got a positive times a positive. And we'll remember that if a function is concave up and we use a tangent line to approximate it, our tangent line will be an underestimate because the function is concave up and lies fully above that tangent line. Good or no? And the points for that were one for getting the correct second derivative and one for underestimate with a reason, which is concave up. Any issues with part B? Feeling okay about these? Yeah. All right, let's look at part C. Part C, I assume, is asking us to solve the differential equation. Yep. So just solve the differential equation with the initial condition W of zero is 1400. So we'll start once again with dW dt at 1 25th and W minus 300. First point will be for separating the variables. So dW over W minus 300 equals 1 25th dt. There's one point. Um, then we'll integrate integral of W minus 300 or 1 over W minus 300 should just be natural log absolute value W minus 300. And the integral on the other side should be 1 25th t plus our constant. You've got one point for the correct antiderivative, one point for putting your constants of integration. And then you get another point if you correctly solve. And we were given that at t equals zero, w is 1400. So we get a constant of 1100. I'm sorry, natural log of 1100. Um, and so then we'll go back in. Uh, that's, uh, sorry, that's our fourth point. And we'll go back in here and we'll write natural log absolute value W minus 300 gives us 1 25th T plus LN 1100. We'll exponentiate both sides, give us W minus 300. And then the E, well, well, we'll write it all out first. E to the 125th T plus LN 1100. The E to the LN 1100 just becomes an 1100 out in front. And we choose the, as we take away the absolute value, we choose the positive version of it because when we plug in 1400, we need to get 1100, not negative 1100. And then we just end up with W equals 300 plus 1100 E to the 125th T. And that's your last point. Good, any questions on that? Can you go back to part B? Question on it or? Uh, no, I just want to ask it a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. 
Any other questions on that? All right. So that's enough of those for right now. We've got anti-differentiation, multiple choice questions to go over today. So, so the shorter, well, maybe it's not that short of a section. I guess it's not that short of a section, but um, hopefully not too many of them were too insanely difficult. So if you have any questions on any of those, now is the time you can just throw them into the chat and I'll just go through them in the order that I see them. All right, we're gonna start with 47. We're not going to start with 47. 47 is a BC, 53 is also a BC only question. So you don't need to know how to do 47 or 53. I got the, the BC only mark next to them. Okay, let's see here. Um, four, so 14 is fourteen gives us dy integral of dy over root four minus y squared. Um, so in order to solve this one out, it looks a lot like uh, looks a lot like the inverse sine ones, right? So what we need to do is we need to find a way to rewrite this thing. Um, so that this value out in front here, the four minus y squared is no longer a four minus y squared. So it makes it a one minus y squared, um, or not a one minus y squared, but a one minus something squared over here. And so I could rewrite this um, as an integral of dy over the square root of four times one minus one fourth y squared. And so if I were to do that, I could then take out this square root of four as a two outside of the integral sign. So I'd have dy, I could put a one half out here, and then I would have a square root of one minus, and then this would become y over two squared if I didn't want to write it as one fourth y squared. And from there, we can do a u substitution. We can let u equal y over two, and then du is one half dy. Well, there's my one half, there's my dy. This just, I'm not sure what happened there. Okay, there, it's all back. Um, I don't know what happened there. Um, so we just end up with an integral of the one half dy becomes du, and then this is the square root of one minus u squared, and that is our inverse sine of u plus a constant. And so we end up with inverse sine of y over two plus a constant. Everybody good there with 14? Yeah. All right.
Not to be here. 49. Okay. So for 49, this way adds a little bit of a tricky one. Um, this is the one that sort of pops up fairly often, though. Um, you might note, um, I guess I should write it out. We got e to the x plus e to the negative x over e to the x minus e to the negative x. Um, that if I were to take the derivative of my denominator, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, and the derivative of negative e to the negative x is positive e to the negative x. So I should be able to substitute out u equals my denominator, because that would give me du equals the derivative of that. And like we just said, that's the numerator. And so we'd end up with an integral of du over u, which should be natural log absolute value of u plus a constant, which is choice D. So it's just a U substitution, but a little tricky to maybe see the U substitution right off the bat. Everybody okay with 49? All right. Next up, I got 23. So for 23, we're just looking at an integral of sine theta, cosine theta, d theta. And so this is a u substitution one. Um, if you choose to make it, you can make it a u substitution or you, well, it's, it's a u substitution, you need it. Um, so I'm not sure which of the answer choices it is offhand right to begin with, so I'm not sure which u substitution to use because there's a lot of different ones we could use. But if I start with this one, u equals sine theta, du is cosine theta, d theta, I just end up with the integral of u du, which is u squared over 2 plus a constant or sine squared theta. Over um, two. I think they use the trig identity to like replace the sine theta cosine theta. Yeah, probably so. So I just I'm going to show multiple different ways to do it. Okay. So so this one is an answer choice that we could get. That answer choice is not one of the answer choices given. Okay. Um, we could also do this as uh, u equals cosine theta. So du would be negative sine theta d theta. So put our negatives, right? Get negative integral of u du gives us negative u squared over 2 plus a constant or negative cosine squared theta over 2 plus a constant, which again is not there. Um, so we go through and say, well, that's another thing we could do with this. Well, the integral of sine theta cosine theta is also the same as 1 half of 2 times that integral which is one half the integral of sine two theta d theta. If we know our double angle identity for sine, so we could then let u equal two theta, du would be two d theta. And so we'd put in our two, we'd put in an extra one half out here. We have one fourth the integral of sine u, oops, that's just not two theta, sine u du. And so the integral of our sine would be negative cosine. So we get negative one fourth cosine u plus our constants. And negative one fourth cosine of two theta plus our constant, which that one appears to be one of our answer choices. Good with that one?
Everyone good with 23 there? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, let's see here. Next one is number five. Okay. So number five is the integral of one minus three y over root two y minus three y squared dy. So for this one, we've got to look at our denominator and say that okay, the denominator is a pain. It'd be nice if I get rid of everything in the denominator except maybe the square root. And so let's just see what happens if we do that. Let's let u equal 2y minus 3y squared. Well, that would give us du would be 2 minus 6y. And then we'd hopefully notice that we almost have 2 minus 6y in the numerator. Um, but instead, we have 1 minus 3y. We have half of it, right? So if I'm going to turn that into 2 minus 6y, I'll multiply it by 2 and put a 1 half out in front. So that'll give me one half the integral of du over root u. Root u in the denominator is u to the negative one half, so that'll go up to become u to the one half. We'll divide by the one half to make it a two. So we get one half of two root u plus a constant, or square root of two y minus three y squared plus our constant, which is choice E, it looks like. Any questions there? Everybody good with that one? All right. Um. Sixteen. So for sixteen, we are looking at pages are sticking. There we go. For number sixteen, we are looking at the integral of two x plus one over two x dx. So anytime you've got a singular term in your denominator, but it's a rational function, first thing you're always going to want to do is just divide everything out. So this becomes an integral of 2x over 2x is 1, and 1 over 2x is just 1 over 2x dx. And then we're going to integrate this. So the integral of 1 is x, and the integral of one half of this x in the denominator should be one half natural log absolute value of x plus your constant, which looks like choice A. Um, so for this question, I didn't factor out the one half and I like used a u sub instead, but then that made it so that um, there was a 2x in my natural log, which wasn't in the answer choices. Yes, yeah, same. Say that again, you did what? Um, I like, I didn't take out the one half for the one over 2x and I just used a u sub. For, oh, I like, see. So you did, so you did u equals 2x. Uh -huh. 2 dx. And so you wrote that as so you x plus the integral. And you threw in you threw in a 2 and you threw in a 1 half. So you had plus 1 half the integral of du over u. Is that right? Yeah. So you had x plus 1 half natural log. Yeah, that's... I can see that. Um, you end up with 1 half natural log absolute value of 2x plus constant which mm -hmm. is exactly the same thing, sort of, except that the answer that you got and the answer that I got and that they got um, differ by a constant. So we can look at this as x plus one half of, 
Well, natural log of the absolute value of 2x, that's two things being multiplied together. So I can rewrite that as natural log of 2 plus natural log of x. And from there, we've then got x plus 1 half ln 2 plus 1 half ln absolute value of x plus some constant. And 1 half natural log of 2 is just a constant, right? And so I've got x plus a half natural log absolute value of x plus a couple of constants, which is just a constant. Okay, I see. So they're, they're not equivalent, but both of them satisfy this integral. And so okay. that's a little tricky. That, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right, that was 16, right? Um, yeah. All right, 13. Now, somebody asked for 13, but then said it's basically the same as 14, but that's not actually quite true. Um, so we're going to look at 13. So 13 is x over root 1 plus 4x squared. Um, this one looks like sort of like those inverse trig ones, like number 14 was with the square root of 4 minus y squared. But it's, uh, it's actually not. So we'll note that what we can do here is we can let u equal 1 plus 4x squared. It's just a u substitution, du, and then the 8x dx. So we'll put in our 8, we'll put in our 1 8. And we've got one eighth of the integral of du over root u, which is one eighth. And u to the negative one half becomes again just like the one we did a little bit ago, two root u plus our constant. So we've now got one fourth the square root of one plus four x squared plus c, which is choice b. Does that make sense to everyone? On that one. All right. Um, sixteen. Okay, we just did sixteen. Twenty four. All right, 24, we're looking at the integral of sine root x over root x dx. Um, and so this is just a u substitution. The annoying piece of this, though, is in the numerator. Um, that root x that's in, inside the sine. And if u is root x, du would be 1 over Two root x dx. Well, I've got the root x in the denominator that I need for my du. I just need a two down there. So we can throw in a two. If I put a two in the denominator, I got to put a two out front to cancel that one half out. So this will become two integral sine u du. And that'll become negative two cosine u plus your constant or negative 2 cosine root x plus your constant, which is choice B. Everybody good there with 24? Any questions on 24? Next one is number 50. See, number 50 gives us an integral of e to the x over 1 plus e to the 2x dx. Uh, let's see. It's a good way to go about this one. 
Mm. Yeah, this one is a U substitution as well. It's a little bit of a tricky one because it actually is uh, with we want U to equal E to the X and du will then be e to the x dx. And so if we can rewrite this as one plus e to the two x is the same as e to the x squared. And if I have something being raised to a power being raised to a power, you multiply the exponents. So e to the x times e to the x or e to the x squared is e to the two x. And so now, I could replace this e to the x with the u, and that leaves me with e to the x dx as my du, and I have du over one plus u squared. And the integral of du over one plus u squared ought to be inverse tangent u plus your constant, which is the inverse tangent of e to the x plus your constant, which I guess is choice A. Good there. Any questions on 50? No. All right. Next one we've got is 73. Sticking together. All right, 73. We are looking at dy, the integral of dy over y plus, I said y, y times one plus natural log of y squared. Okay. Um, let's see, let's think about this a little bit. Well, that's a good way to do 73. Ah, okay, I see a good way here. Let's do this. Let's let u equal one plus natural log of y squared. Uh, if u is one plus natural log of y squared, we could also write that as one plus natural log, I'm sorry, one plus two natural log of y. Right? If we were to um, pull this power of two out to the front of it. And so now, what is du equal? Du is just two over y dy. And we've got the over y, we just need the two. So I'll put it in the one half, which gives us one half the integral of du over u. And that should be natural log absolute value u plus our constant, which is natural log absolute value of one plus natural log of y squared plus the constant, which Looks like choice A. Any questions there on 73? All right, next one. We've got is twenty one. Right, twenty one. We've got the integral of dy over root y times one minus root y. 
Um, so for this one, we're going to, again, just need to use a u substitution. We're just going to let u equal 1 minus root y. du then is negative 1 over 2 root y. And if I'm getting rid of all this 1 minus root y, I need to have a dy in the numerator and a root y in the denominator, and then I need to have a negative 1 half. So we'll put in our negative two in the denominator, which means we're going to put in a negative two in the numerator. So this will become negative two integral of du over u, which is again negative two natural log absolute value of u plus your constant, which was choice E, it looks like. Any questions there on 21? I know two or three of you asked me for that one. All right in a row somehow. Nope. Everyone good there? Okay. All right. Next one is 52. All right. So, um, 52, we've got the integral of natural log root x over x dx. So um, this one, we're going to want to rewrite using some log rules should make this a lot easier. So natural log root x is the same as one half natural log x, right? Because this is x to the one half and a power can be pulled out to the front. And I can just take that one half out to the front. So one half the natural log of x dx over x. And then we'll do a u substitution. We'll let u equal ln x. du is one over x dx, which we've got the one over x and the dx. So this just becomes one half the integral of u du for our one half u squared over two plus our constant for natural log of x squared over four plus a constant, which appears to be choice E. Any questions there on 52? Nope. All right. Seventy four. Oh, this is ooh, this is the challenge problem. Exciting. So we got an integral of tangent theta minus one squared d theta. So um, first thing that we'll probably do here is take a look at this and see if there's like a u sub that we can use right away, but I don't see one. So let's try to expand this out. So tangent theta minus one squared is tangent squared theta minus two tangent theta. plus one d theta. And from there, we could rewrite that. One plus tangent squared is equal to secant squared theta. So we got secant squared theta minus two tangent theta d theta. Secant squared theta should be an easy one. That's just tangent theta. And then we've got minus two times the integral of tangent theta, which we may or may not, oops, we may or may not memorize the integral of tangent theta. I told you guys it might be helpful to, but if you didn't, you can always rewrite it as sine theta over cosine theta, and then do a u substitution. So tangent theta minus two, and if we let u equal cosine, 
du equals negative sine theta d theta. So we'll put in our negative and change that to a positive. So we got plus two times the integral of, and then that should be du over u. So we end up with tangent theta plus two natural log absolute value u, which is cosine theta plus a constant, which looks like it is choice B. Pretty good there with 74. Multiple people yeah. on the road asking for 74 again. All right. And that will be the last one that we are looking at here is number 70, which is the integral. Oh, oh we're going to have more. Yeah, so what is 70? 70 is the integral of dx over 1 minus e to the x. Another, ooh, another challenge problem. Exciting. Okay. Um, Hmm. What is a good way to go about this one? Hmm. See if we can find a good trick to use here. Let me think about this for a second. All right. Here's a good trick. Let's do this. Um, let us, instead of leaving it like this, having a one dx over the one minus e to the x, let's write this as an integral of one minus e to the x plus e to the x over 1 minus e to the x dx. Um, I wouldn't expect them to put one this difficult in the multiple choice or the free response, where you got to add in a bunch of terms to be able to integrate it. But this is this is a good way to do this one. Um, so if I add, if I subtract an e to the x and add an e to the x to the numerator, I've effectively not changed my numerator. But what I'm now going to do is I'm going to take this piece of it and then this piece of it and write two separate integrals. So this becomes an integral of 1 minus e to the x over 1 minus e to the x, which is 1, plus an integral of e to the x over 1 minus e to the x dx. And the integral of 1 is x. And then over here, for this one, we're going to do a u substitution. So we're going to let u equal 1 minus e to the x. du will be negative e to the x. So I'm going to need a negative and a negative. And so instead of having a plus down here, we'll change that to a minus. So I'll have minus the integral of, and then our negative e to the x dx. So if you write my dx there, it becomes my du in the numerator. And then my 1 minus e to the x is du over u. This becomes x minus natural log absolute value of 1 minus e to the x plus the constant. Which looks like that's choice. Looks like choice B. Any questions there on that one? I wouldn't expect you to have to do one that difficult. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if they put one like that on there. <clears throat> All right, one more it looks like now, number 78. So, 78 says we got a particle moving along, moving along a line with an acceleration equal to 2 plus 6 t. Um, when t equals zero, 
velocity equals three. And also position is equal to two. We want to find the position when t equals one. So this is a multi-step initial value type problem. <clears throat> so um, we'll define v. We're going to integrate a of t. Integral of 2 is 2t. Integral of 6t squared is plus 3t squared plus our constant. We know that when t is 0, velocity needs to be 3. So 0 plus 0 plus c. So our constant is 3. So our velocity function is 2t plus 3t squared plus 3. And then we will integrate velocity to get our position function t squared minus t cubed plus 3t plus some isn't it 2t plus 3t yeah i think you forgot a plus sign i just skipped some pluses in there i just dropped a plus sign i did just drop a plus sign weird all right um sorry t squared plus t cubed plus 3t And then we know that when t is 0, the position is 2, so 0 plus 0. What's in the world? I have no idea what that is. What is that? Why won't it go away? I can make it go away. Perfect. So 2, our position, equals 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus that other constant. So that constant is 2. So our position function is t squared plus t cubed plus 3t plus 2. And at t equals 1, that'd be 1 plus 1 plus 3 plus 2 for a position of 7. Looks like that's choice d. Good there now. Anybody else have any other questions? That's the last one anyone's asked for. Okay, 72. 72 is the integral of e to the 2 ln u du. Um, so, well, e to the uh, e to the 2 ln u. We should just rewrite that before we try to do anything. Should become e to the ln of u squared. Right? If I pull that 2 inside the logarithm. And e to the ln of u squared is just u squared. So u cubed over 3 plus a constant, which is choice c. <clears throat> Everybody get that? Any other questions? All right.